Hello everyone, a warm welcome again to this lecture of today. Uh, today we're going to talk about different elements. Uh, so one of the elements that we will talk about today is the diverse knowledge systems that are out there. Uh, Eurocentrism in knowledge production at universities, uh, specifically of course Western universities, epistemicide, so the destruction of other, other ways of knowing and knowledges. Um, next we will also talk about movements at the university that we're aiming to uh, yeah, diversify, de decolonize the yeah, university as an institution uh, from different parts of the world, uh, specifically also the student movement at Amsterdam, which I was part of. And uh, lastly, we will also talk about the tensions between diversity and inclusion discourse and uh, decolonization uh, in more or less that order. Um, so yeah, I hope you're looking forward. Uh, I am looking forward uh, yeah, to share with you what I have for today. Um, so I wanted to begin off, uh, yeah, this time by sharing something beautiful instead of, uh, you know, starting immediately with what went wrong and the epistemicides and things like this. Um, so I would like to do this uh, by looking at this picture. Uh, so what you see here is a star sky in Australia and the stars happen to be very important uh, there for the original peoples there, the, the, the indigenous peoples, First Nations or Aboriginals, depends uh, who you ask uh, how they refer to. Uh, refer to. Um, but for them, the stars were really important. And they were important because uh, they didn't have script or let's say written uh, language. They didn't have a yeah, script in that sense. Uh, so they, their knowledge was uh, given orally. So it was an oral tradition and through ancestors, knowledge was kept in given from generation to generation to generation. And their script or their letters, their writings were basically in the stars. And uh, so for them, uh, when they see the stars, they see all their uh, ancestors and the knowledge is kept there. Uh, because what they believe, for instance, if, uh, if they see a falling star in the sky, they believe that uh, one of their, uh, uh, someone who passed away is returning back uh, to the other ancestries who has gone before them uh, where they will be uh, yeah together in a circle at the holy fire so all these stars that you see are different fires of ancestry uh, sitting there and uh, i want to share one creation story of one of these stars and they have many of these creation stories of different stars uh, but with this star uh, particularly uh, I couldn't get to my notes, I, I, I forgot the star name, um, but the story goes that a long, long, long time ago, uh, there was a, f uh, yeah, there was hunger, there wasn't enough food because of uh, winter, and uh, what happened, one of the elders uh, of the, the village, uh, she, um, she went out to look for food, basically, uh, because she was like, if this goes on, uh, people will die, so she, she left the tribe and went on to look for food and as she went uh, further and further she found a piece of uh, yeah a few trees and in the bark there were larvae uh, larvae eating and she uh, started eating the larvae and found out the, these were very nutritious and then she uh, when she went back she told the others hey there's a lot of larvae in this tree uh, we should uh, go there and collect them so we can eat it so we don't, um, yeah, so we have enough food. And after she uh, died and uh, the, yeah, let's say the fallen star took her back, she became the star. Uh, and this particular star, uh, it's only visible during a certain period of the year in the evening. So now the, this group knew when to get these larvae, when was the right season, by looking at the stars and seeing, oh, the star is visible again on that place in the sky. Now we know we can get the larvae. So that is an example of how, yeah, that their knowledge is, is kept in the stars through stories and oral traditions and ancestry. And uh, yeah, it's not only for survival, but also their laws, social relations and things like this are inscripted in the stars uh, and, and the stories. So, um, uh, yeah, that's an example, and I could tell you this story because, wait, one second, my phone is ringing, and it's annoying. I'm going to put it on airplane for a sec. All right. Uh, so, yeah, um, 
and this this uh, story I was able to tell you because in Australia there was an uh, initiative now to to um, basically recollect these stories and uh, have uh, Aboriginal astronomy part of the curriculum. There's been initiatives at university, uh, and that's why I was able through the internet to find this beautiful story uh, as it has been made part of the university. Uh, and I think this is just, yeah, to, to show in, in terms of knowledge systems and, and different ways of knowing how indigenous cultures are often connected to the land, to communities, relationships and the environment and very much embedded, uh, yeah, in their way of knowing. They, they know who they are through both the land and their ancestry of them. And uh, I think this is also very apparent in uh, Native American culture, for instance, uh, if you look at cultural expressions, the hair, the, 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 the braid is very important. And uh, yeah, there's a beautiful saying I, I got from the internet that says that uh, sweet grass is the hair of our mother, the earth, each strand alone is not as strong as when braided together. Sweet grass represents the northern direction on the medicine wheel, all life is sacred. And what it says that, yeah, that the one strand is not as strong as stra when the whole strands are together. So um, traditionally these braids, you do it with your family members. You braid it, let's say every morning, for instance. So you know, you remember that together as a family, uh, you are stronger than alone. So it's a way of taking care, a way of uh, uh, saying a prayer before you start the day to give it good intentions. Uh, in their culture, for instance, they also have, um, in a Shawnee tradition, uh, you see their mask be, uh, below. And, uh, and there's one where basically someone dresses up as um, during a certain period of the year uh, to basically uh, scare the children who do something wrong or disrespectful to the environment. And it says, it's, it's, yeah, to embody in a, a a spirit force from the uh, from nature that is basically the guardian uh, of the sacred uh, saying that if you're not respectful to the environment uh, bad things will happen so it's a way to teach children also to respect the environment and you see this also in the way they have conceptualized time for instance um, one interesting concept for instance they have usually if you uh, is, is their concept of time because usually in the Western world when you when we talk about time you would ask someone hey uh, where do you want to be in five or ten years uh, right or in policy it's maybe a, a ten year policy frame maybe 25 year policy frame but not much longer than this and uh, in their tradition for instance uh, for the Iroquois and Lakota also uh, they have the concept of seven generations so um seven generations means that is their normal time frame that means that you look ahead seven generations as your time frame so you don't ask hey what do you want to do tomorrow in that sense you think of okay where do i want to be in seven generations so you think in generations ahead so that means for instance if it comes to land that you if you would take away certain things in the land then after seven generations there wouldn't be enough for others uh so that means you don't want to do that um so there's all kinds of knowledge also when to fish what kind of fish to fish etc uh, indigenous people usually know uh, because they have lived uh for thousands of years in many places of the world with their environment so they know how not to yeah destroy that environment because they have to live from that environment for generations and i think this shows yeah the way their knowledge systems are built and it's deeply connected to the environment and the people around them and things like this. Um, and on the other hand, if you look at Western culture uh, and expressions, uh, you, you see something completely different, right? Uh, for instance, the jean that is now uh, fashionable, right? Everyone wears jeans. Jeans were uh, normal workers' clothing for mine workers. This was first because they were quite, uh, let's say, durable. Uh, so, so this comes from from uh, from uh, of, uh, labor. Uh, we have Christmas, of course, which is really yeah uh, backed around consumerism. Uh, uh, the, the, the present, uh, if a child is nice, you get a present. You be able to consume things. Yeah, uh, and 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 if you look at the 
uh, for instance, the role of women, you see that uh, the, the expression, for instance, of housewife was also connected to uh, um, industrialization because a housewife uh, was something, you know, the, the man would go to work to the mine or to the, to the, to the factory and a woman had to take care of, let's say, if a clothes were break down, to knit it, to cook, to wash, things like this. Otherwise, the, yeah, the husband couldn't do all the things he needed to do. So there needed to be a division of labor. So you had literal schools, uh, at least in the Netherlands, uh, it was called how, uh, yeah, Huishoud Scholen. So like uh, a school to teach you how to be a housewife. Uh, and even in the Netherlands, up until the 60s, if you would work for government and you would start uh, and you got married or children, uh, they would uh, fire you uh, or your contract would end because that would mean, oh, now you're becoming a mother. Now you, be, you have to be at the house as a housewife. So things like this, yeah, gave the institutional character of the gen division of gender roles. Um, uh, and of course, uh, yeah, you had a lot of uh, homophobic uh, institutions as well. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in different yeah knowledge systems and traditions uh gender was looked at differently uh i mean in western culture you have for instance in dutch the domme blondje dom dom blondie uh, I, I would translate it but basically that yeah uh, i would say that uh, a blonde girl is stupid basically that's the and there's jokes about this uh, and stereotypes that they never understand certain things as mad and things like that or you have the evil witch right these are the kind of characters we have uh, for women in our culture. Uh, and in other traditions, it's very different. Uh, for instance, you see here uh, a, a tattoo uh, at, at the, the bottom side with the headband. You see a tattoo below her uh, mouth, uh, at her chin. And this tattoo is uh, from, from indigenous people in uh, Maluku, uh, uh, Alifuru people, and they're uh, in, in their uh, culture, this represents that, uh, yeah, it's like a waterfall of, of words and wisdom. Uh, and these are usually traditional women tattoos because the women were often seen as the ones, the keepers of knowledge, passing on a lot orally. And this tattoo would represent that knowledge sharing with the community. Uh, and, and you have, for instance, the grandma, mother, spider, uh, yeah, giving, in a form of a spider, female energy giving, um, uh, uh yeah wisdom in times of need uh you can google that as well it's also a mythology from yeah uh, native american traditions or you have two-spirited people uh, i think they had seven genders or something in, in native american culture i'm not sure how many you can probably look that up but uh, one of them would be two-spirited and two-spirited means basically that you're non-binary i i guess if you would put it in uh, current feminist language so basically that you don't identify as either male or female and uh, yeah there's a lot of stigma of course in the western world around uh, being a transgender and everything but in native american culture this was uh, a lot of times seen as an enrichment because now you have knowledge of both worlds both female and male uh, so being two-spirited had an, an, an its own value uh, as a human being, not uh, I mean, now we just tolerate it, I guess, or not make it illegal, but there it had its own place. Uh, and I wanted to share these, all these examples, um, basically uh, to, to show, because often we talk about the problems, but to show how much richness there is in different cultures, in the, yeah, in, uh, in, their, in their clothing and everything. Uh, I mean, if you look also in the clothing, uh, a lot of times um, you see the, in the clothing, there's meaning, there's knowledge embroidered in them. Uh, while a lot of times, if you look at clothing in the Western world, it's about hierarchy. Do you have expensive clothes uh, to, to, to portray authority, royalty? Uh, yes, to, to, to make a division who's worth something and who's not. Um, so I think through the culture, you can see who really uh, people are, uh, right? I mean, the, here we don't talk about stars and, and, and uh, yeah, wise grandmothers, but about, uh, yeah, genocidarians who are uh, our heroes and conquerors. Um, and I think looking at this from a decolonial perspective, what is said, um, this was something uh, Roberto Hernandez, a Mexican 
a scholar once shared how they look from an indigenous perspective of what needs to be done to work towards a new world is to basically build bridges between these two different worlds so you have the modern world and the the world that is still outside of this modern colonial world which are indigenous knowledge systems and of course uh, it's very rare to have uh, yeah communities and peoples who are not affected by this colonial system because it has gone global it has gone everywhere uh, but the idea is and this circle represented that every community has more or less knowledge that is still outside the modern world so you have in the middle the gray area let's say the, the modern colonial knowledge system but outside there's there's this overlap and people are standing in both worlds of uh, having yeah both internalized the western knowledge and system but also the other and um, and the idea is that these circles that are intellect should exchange so the yeah the the genocidal colonial civilization which they sometimes call the civilization of death uh, uh, can be transformed into something new so it's important to build these bridges and i think an uh, example where this can be done or an effort that has been made is for instance the buen vivir philosophy of indigenous people in uh, ecuador uh, uh, said that nature is its own right its own being and based on their philosophy uh, it's the first country that gave nature constitutional rights to be able to be preserved and not be uh, yeah destroyed uh, you can look that up as well uh, Buen Vivir nature rights so that's very interesting how indigenous knowledge informed then uh, laws of that country uh, surrounding nature uh, and of course it's not perfect but it's it's to give an example how this bridging could work and look like in practice uh, and I think yeah I, I suggested to read one of the books of someone who's also really a bridge builder is uh, Patrice Malidoma Somme uh, and the Healing Wisdom of Africa is a book of I read of him I can really recommend and he basically was someone who was uh, yeah kidnapped as a child to one of these schools where they uh, yeah un unlearn you your own mother language and uh, culture and everything and they punish you for yeah, uh, yeah being yourself um, and he was at, at one of these boarding schools uh, in Burkina Faso and at the time he ran away when he was 14 or 12 he ran away from that school back to his village on his bare feet and when he was back to his village uh, he's explaining in the book how he first thought what a primitive village there's no showers there's no pavement etc he really had a modern gaze on his own people um, but he didn't want to go back to the boarding school either and uh, when he was back uh, there they the elders did take him in again and they started to teach him uh, they started to teach him their ways and at some point um the elders said uh to him when he, he got initiated to be part of this uh, family it's very important their initiations um and uh through the initiation he got his name as well uh because they're in their tradition uh you get your real name uh, around the age of 16 uh, some around that age uh, after your initiation with a community and the elders have observed who are you and what is your purpose and what is your gift to the community uh, and his name became Patrice Maridoma Somme uh, which means he who befriends the stranger slash enemy he who becomes yeah the bridge between the en uh, between us and the enemy uh, that became his name because Patrice Maridoma was standing in both worlds um so they didn't tell it immediately after this initiation uh, but he had to leave the village after a while because they said yeah you're too modern you're still disturbing the energy here um you have to go uh and but you have to share what we have taught you here in or in terms of spirituality uh, and bring it to the other world so they don't yeah even consume all the life uh, so they sent him out to to translate their knowledge of healing tradition spirituality to the modern world and uh, this is what he's trying to do through his books and his work and i think he does that really well uh, because he is standing in two worlds so uh, it's a really beautiful book uh, i would really recommend um so yeah about this there's so much knowledge and ways of being being invisibilized if you look at the eurocentricity of of universities it's it's beyond i mean if you look at the 
the richness of, of, of knowledge out there. There's 6,000 languages worldwide spoken. And, and yet we only speak in the universities, maybe the five colonial languages. Uh, and yeah, you see a lot of these knowledges and languages and cultures are disappearing as well because of the yeah, ongoing colonialism. And uh, I think, yeah, to, to, to wind back a bit in history, uh, Ramon Curros Fagel is asking these questions, right? In his uh, paper that you had to read. Uh, and he, his main question is, okay, how come uh, I'll read it out. He says in his first question, how is it possible that the canon of thought in all the discipline of the social sciences and humanities in westernized university is based on the knowledge produced by a few men from five countries in Western Europe, Italy, France, England, Germany, and the USA. And then he's also asking, how is it possible that men from these five countries came to monopolize the authority of knowledge in the world and other knowledges made us inferior? What are the world historical processes that produce structures of knowledge founded on epistemic racism and sexism. So what was the base that all this knowledge that we have today that's seen as universal came only from these five countries and from only men specifically. Uh, and, he, and he analyzed, fear, uh, he, he summarized four big uh, epistemicides slash genocides that made this possible, that this monopoly came on only this very small group of the world. Uh, and this was one of them was the conquest of the Muslim and Jewish world in Andalus and the Moors with the, uh, yeah, the conquista of the Spanish empire where they burned the books and destroyed the, yeah, the, the, the libraries of Jewish and Muslims. And also uh, they forced them to become Christians. Uh, then another big genocide he describes is of course the conquest against indigenous peoples, uh, which you already know probably, uh, make inferiorizing and yeah, making these racial hierarchies, the enslavement of Africans speaks for itself as well. But also this one is maybe not thought in this course already uh, and maybe something interesting an uh, interesting author to tell you more about the uh, witch hunts in Europe, which is the fourth genocide is Silvia Fredericci. It's, it's a really cool book as well. And basically this tells the story how hundreds of thousands up to millions of women were burned in Europe and these women were often Indo-European women who had basically indigenous look like knowledge as in uh, were more plant-based and uh, yeah uh, medicine woman uh, and they were later yeah uh, labeled as witches and burnt so instead of uh, he says instead of the books that were burned the bodies were burned of the witches that were keepers of uh, uh, indigenous knowledges of in the European context. Um, so yeah, I think uh, they, these are the four big genocide epistemicides that he characterizes and describes in his article to say, okay, these were all destroyed and pushed out. So there became one dominant view. And uh, also interesting, many of the, uh, like for instance, Francis Bacon, but also other known uh, philosophers or, or contributors to Western science were rich hunters themselves as well. They were uh, sitting trials or things like this. Uh, so that's also interesting. And they were also, besides racist, also sexist. Uh, yeah, these Enlightenment thinkers. Um, but then, yeah, what he talks about, what is left behind, this, this Eurocentric view of being a scientist and knowledge keeper is, uh, yeah, the, the mind and the body became separated. And then he yeah, refers to Descartes' thought, like, I think, therefore I am, uh, yeah, putting it in the head, let's say, and uh, that the mind is objective and uh, independent from the body. And it can, from a neutral position, then uh, categorize and analyze things. And, that be and these become universal truths. They become applied to every context. Uh, uh, and that's basically the, the, the premise of on which science, a lot of Western science is uh, based from these assumptions and that the others lack rationality, they are more emotional and this is not true knowledge, uh, things like this. So other ways of knowing are inferiorized. Um, so yeah, I, I think you can see this Eurocentrism working a lot today. This, if you look at the right map, uh, you can see here the continents. Uh, they made it uh, in terms of numbers of papers. How big, the, how bigger, how big the country is. The larger the country is on this map, the more papers are written there on universities. And you can see Africa is barely on the map. But basically, the entire global south is gone. It's just the the north producing 
a lot of these papers. So you can see the university is literally quantitatively, but also qualitatively very Eurocentric. And yeah, you can ask who does this knowledge then serve? So all the knowledge is produced from these places. Uh, and you can see uh, there's many beautiful disciplines. Uh, for instance, if you look at Buddhism as a knowledge producing system, let's say, uh, I went to a monastery in, uh, yeah, it was called Plum Village in France. And there, the, when the, to become a monk there, you had to pass an exam, uh, an oral exam, where they would ask you how well you would be able to know and describe your emotions. And in their understanding, you have 58 emotions. I mean, I can maybe mention 10 or 15 emotions, like angry, sad, happy, etc. But they can describe and have words for in their language for 58 emotions and to be able to, yeah, uh, name these and, 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 and learn from these. So yeah, you, as a monk, you have to, uh, yeah, train and develop knowledge of your internal world, your emotional world. Uh, with the goal of uh, yeah finding inner peace etc uh, so this is another knowledge system another way of of of, of, of gaining knowledge um, and and yeah it's it's depending on the context what is relevant so there in in, in their world uh, and knowing having this inner knowledge is relevant uh, to talking about a peaceful world um, and what Ramon Grosvigal is saying, and then this is a lot in the decolonial literature talked about as well as the pluriversal world instead of a university. So instead of a university, a pluriversity, so a place where instead of we say there's a one type of knowledge, one type of knowing from a certain geographical place, we, we have to go, the, all the knowledge system are equally valid. There's a pluriversity of worlds uh, instead of one dominant one, which we should work for instead of having a hegemony um yeah and i guess you can see it in who, who's deemed the knowledge seeker to uh, yeah knowledge keeper it means very white university and male dominated uh yeah you can see it still today um yes yeah, so this is another quote from Ramon from cross in westernized universities the knowledge produced by other epistemologies cosmologies and worldviews arising from other world regions with diverse time, space, dimensions and characterized by different geopolitics and body politics of knowledge are considered inferior in relation to the superior knowledge produced by few Western men of five countries that compose the canon of thought in the humanities and social sciences. And I, I think you can see this, eh, that, that others are not seen as knowledge producers. You can see this, uh, two examples, how you can see this today is, uh, for instance, the claims of the Maasai people, indigenous people in uh, East Africa, uh, against cultural appropriation of uh, fashion labels. And they won these cases, uh, I think, because uh, they were appropriating their, uh, yeah, their patterns and their, their color fabrics into uh, fashion uh, items. And how you can see that they are not seen as knowledge producers is because normally you have a, copyrights right you, you don't just take someone's idea and say it as it is yours and this is a colonial relationship because in the past also with archaeology for instance a lot of archaeologists who are cited now as having found things often uh, uh, did this through indigenous guides etc so but these are not named because indigenous people are not humans in the racist sense uh, of the university i view of the 19th century etc uh, so the one who found out things is then the white scientist who went to retrieve knowledge in nature in which, yeah, the people are part of this. And I mean, if you, if you don't respect, if you respect copyrights, uh, intellectual rights of another fashion industry, but not of indigenous people, then you have the same power dynamic, uh, yeah, that you don't recognize them as knowledge producers. So this is a way it, in an inexplicit way that you see this uh, uh, unequal uh, power structure working today. And I, and, uh, I found it really interesting, this court case, that they, uh, then these people went to court, uh, yeah, used the system to get their uh, rights and their share for their knowledge production. Um, so in this piece, I wanna, uh, yeah, uh, so the university, I, I would say, is if I mean if colonialism was a body, then university would be its its brain basically, uh, its head. Yeah, and I, and that's 
also seeing as head there, for instance, in Amsterdam, the university um, was part of the municipality, for instance, Amsterdam University was part of the municipality till 1976, um, something like that around the 70s. And this is uh, because the university is very essential for colonialism and government, as you know. And what I wanted to say about this is that um, knowledge knowledge has a function it has a purpose it has a certain place in a society and if you look at the knowledge produced at universities historically both historically and right now is that they serve the state and uh yeah corporations uh to give examples you have the law faculty to train uh bureaucrats government officials uh, lawyers judges to be able to make the legal system work on which this yeah, state is based. Uh, and so one of the oldest faculties as well, if you would say, I have land in Indonesia, you need to have a legal framework for it or that to work. If you look at the arms industry, these have been traditionally made by scientists who were at the first maybe for kings and queens developing better guns or, or fortresses, uh, things like this. Uh, so. Uh, science, knowledge production has always also been an instrument for war, which you can see until today. You had the botanic gardens, eh, which you had all these classifications made of different plant species because which plant is more productive for the plantation, right? Uh, so it has a purpose. Why are we studying this plant? Oh, because we have plantations. Uh, uh, and you had the racial scientists, the enlightenment thinkers to think of the philosophy underpinning the racial democracy and everything that we talked about earlier. So yeah, just to, to for you, the, the message is knowledge has a certain purpose and an intent, uh, just as the stars for the Aboriginal people, which I started with, have a purpose uh, of preserving and living in that environment. And the seventh generation have a purpose in a certain context. And this is, the university is in a colonial context produced. And I think if you, uh, uh, and I think, yeah, it was nice said by the video that you have to watch where Nemeke Tundama also said, uh, uh, as a statement, you cannot decolonize British universities because they were never colonized. They are, in fact, the colonizers. And I think that's a good summar summary. Um, and also another quote uh, by Lindsay Tuaway Smith. Uh, it's nice how a lot of indigenous people also look at science and the history. Uh, I'll quote it. When mentioned in many indigenous contexts, it stirs up silence. It conjures up bad memories. It raises a smile that is knowing and distrustful. It is so powerful that indigenous people even write poetry about research, the ways in which scientific research is implicated in the worst excesses of colonialism remains a powerful remembered history for many of the world's colonized peoples. It is a history that still offends the deepest sense of our humanity. Just knowing that someone measured our faculties by filling the skulls of our ancestors with millet seeds and compared the amount of millet seeds to the capacity for mental thought offends our sense of who and what we are. Uh, so yeah, I thought that was a powerful quote. And I think if you look also at the way university perceive the world and the indigenous people and knowledge perceive the world. You can see, uh, uh, I like this, this, this protest board also that says, we are not defending nature, we are nature defending itself. They really see this intricate connection of themselves in the environment. And the university always has seen and looked for ways to extract from the environment, separated humans from nature, have a Eurocent uh, anthropocentric view, etc. Um, yeah, and I think it's important to think what are we contributing to. Um, but nonetheless, can we decolonize the university? Can we not? I don't have the answer for this, um, but what we can see historically, there has been many movements from the university, just as we saw in the last week's lesson, through law you can get your rights, right? Many people, the laws were against people against uh, gay rights, against women, everything. And women, uh, black people, everyone stood up to change the law system to be able to defend them. And you can say the same is happening also in university that uh, many movements have tried to transform the university to work for 
people uh, or, or uh, reappropriate knowledge at the university for independence movements. Huh? So many, many of the independence thinkers, they use the concept, as you know from before, uh, of state sovereignty, uh, citizenship. These were concepts produced at the university. So basically a lot of thinkers, uh, anti-colonial, decolonial thinkers said, hey, if, if white people have these rights, we should be able to have these rights as well. And many of these people went to Western universities as well, then saying, hey, uh, this should apply to us as well. It's a form of, yeah, using that knowledge to basically start claiming your rights. And in the US, you can see there was a big student protest movement during the civil rights movement, not only for civil rights, but also at university campuses, where you had the third world liberation front with a, I think, six month strike or something, the biggest in US history, where uh, out of these student movements came, came the ethnic studies departments, uh, so new departments and study lanes, uh, uh yeah at universities true protest basically and this map also shows worldwide all the different student protests at 1968 uh mapped in the world uh and they were basically yeah deposing either dictators and things like this so university has always been an important ground for protest as well besides colonizing yeah colonizing or at least around this period um <clears throat> so about the Amsterdam student protest. Um, I think I will tell this in the second part. I'm gonna get some water, uh, so I'll be back. And then uh, we'll talk about the Amsterdam student protest and then the tension between diversity and decolonization. <laughs> 